greeting viewers on the web and rainy Wednesday. And welcome to the ninth season of the PAM Public Design Lectures or DLS. I'm Dexter Ko, convener for this season, and I will be introducing our speaker today, architect Alan Tay, who is the principal of Atelier Alan Tay Architect, AATA, established in 2005. The firm has won several PAM awards in various categories since 2016, with the most notable signature high-rise project, Unif 360 Place, located at Serdang, Kuala Lumpur. Today, AATA serves several top developers as well as private clients and community bodies in various specialized building categories, ranging from residential, commercial, mixed use, and industrial to healthcare and community based projects. Alan also teaches design in several local universities and actively, and actively engages with the academic sectors to promote critical thinking, uh, design thinking. Apart from being invited to speak in several architecture school graduation shows, he also served as one of the jurors of PEM Student Awards in recent years. He used to curate art and design exhibitions at his art gallery, which was part of a design studio setup from 2013 to 18. His interest in art and architecture crossover is a test bed for many placemaking experiments too. Alan undertook his undergraduate and graduate studies in architecture at the University of Tasmania, Australia, under full Tasmanian International Merit Scholarship. Today, architect Alan will be presenting placemaking as an, an emerging form of architectural practice. There has been a lot of discourse, investigation, and experimentation in placemaking in recent years with regards to urban design and architecture in the context of urban renewal and revival worldwide. Take, for example, in the case of the 2012 London Olympics, the City of London took the opportunity to lay out a massive urban placemaking exercise with the ambitious conversion of the rundown industrial estates of East London into the most sustainable township in post Olympic era. Our speaker, Alan Tay, will share his involvement in placemaking projects in various scale and locations, in particular at his hometown of Bukit Batajam, EM where he is one of the founding members of Rakan Bukit Pataja, the NGO which was instrumental in the effort to preserve the intrinsic heritage and culture of BMO town. He will demonstrate how, through the collective effort of the locals from all walks of life and the city council of MBSP, the local communities could finally see a new direction to steer the century-old town of Bukit Pataja towards a new possibility. Alente feels the important relevance of urban regeneration, particularly in the post-COVID-19 era. And one cannot simply ignore the placemaking skills within the stakeholders group, including policymakers, project managers, designers, and collaborators. May I please welcome architect Alan Tay to present placemaking as an emerging form of architectural practice. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's definitely my, my privilege to be invited to, uh, to talk about base making. Um, I've been practicing architecture for the past 20 years. And uh, recently, I was also involved in um, base making in a various uh, scale and uh, particularly in my hometown, Bukit Pataja. So today, I'm going to show you uh, some of my works, uh, basically the, more of the process rather than the end product. Uh, just now, you were looking at the videos was actually uh, the 
2019 uh, Bukit Mutajam uh, Cultural Festival uh, video, promotional, uh, promotional video. What we are looking at was actually the end of the Hungry Ghost Festival, where the, all the uh, 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 communities uh, were actually helping to actually send the Hungry Ghost back to uh, uh, hell. So it's actually a 14 days event where we also coincide with the, uh, this uh, religious festival. So a little bit of the introduction. Uh, for all you know, Penang, uh, actually Penang consists of the island as well as the Sabrang Prai. Okay? And Bukit Madajam is located at the central part of Sabrang Prai. Um, there are two things that uh, is uh, quickly uh, easily associated with Bukit Madajam. One is the hill, where it's actually a landmark. As you drive past uh, Juru Highway, you can actually see it from afar. The other thing is the, is the railway line, uh, because it's uh, one of the earliest uh, railway lines established by the British in Malaya time in 1900s. And on your left, you can see actually is a local map that we created as part of the festival event. Okay. Um, so today, my content is roughly uh, broken up into about six, seven sections. I have about 80 slides to share. So uh, please uh, follow me closely. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a little bit on myself, um, my background. Um, after finishing high school, I, I went to uh, Canada and then, uh, then to Tasmania. Uh, Tasmania is a very small school. We started with about 30 over students in first year. We only have about two, two Asian students plus the rest are all local students. So, um, and one of the intrinsic um, program in the school is that we have a timber shop where we actually uh, uh, make buildings, small uh, buildings by uh, working on it uh, ourselves, learning how the joinery, uh, learning how to build ourselves, uh, working with the, also the local communities. So every year we have this uh, timber uh, workshop where you can take it up as an elective studio. So uh, uh, one of these pictures shown here is actually a, a shed where we designed for a local primary school. During my years out, um, I also took a student exchange to Norway as a student exchange program uh, students uh, studying one semester in Norway. And the picture on the bottom, the second on the left is actually my thesis project. I actually used the Bukit Mandajam uh, Town Center as my uh, site uh, for the thesis. But uh, I think it, uh, most of the architects uh, has the same experience whereby you use a certain local site as your thesis and soon after graduation, you probably uh, will go, uh, go back to work and are working on projects that is not relevant to your, where you are born or where you have a, a kind of a close uh, association with. You know? So it's a pity, but uh, to me, it's, I think the fate uh, brought me back to Bukit Matajam and I am lucky to actually uh, can uh, continue back my research in Bukit Matajam and continue to contribute back to the uh, local architecture scene. And soon after graduation, I came back to KL and uh, started working and got my part three, so on and so forth. So uh, the projects are highlighted. I think I need not go further. I sh shall just uh, show you guys uh, what I've been working on the past few years, starting with architecture. And then in 2011, where we moved to the new office in Jayawan, I started a small gallery for myself where I uh, curate works for art exhibitions. And during that time also, I get to know a lot of uh, cultural activists and uh, place makers and also uh, cultural um, sort of uh, people working in different uh, sectors. And so I have the chance to actually collaborate with them. Um, so I also involved in art festivals, uh, namely like the Kada Party Festival in Itra in two, uh, 2016. And subsequently I was then have a chance to actually uh, introduce to the local uh, BM Hungry Ghost Festival uh, Committee, uh, where they actually intended to uh, rebuild their uh, this uh, Hungry Ghost, uh, this Yulan Square uh, shed, where it's actually very run down. So I was actually, I did the proposal for them in 2014. And uh, in 2015, I collaborated with UCSI to actually uh, make it as a student uh, studio project. And then students came down to have a field trip, a study trip, and then they designed this shed for the, you know, as the studio work. And then later on, we went on to actually uh, 
design and build and complete the work for them. And since then, I uh, constantly travel back to my hometown and then involved in uh, some of the local works as well, local uh, projects uh, with the local schools, local community, and also of course business entities. And of course, subsequently with uh, this involvement, I slowly move into placemaking. So there are a few, I think, important milestones happening in Bukem Pitajang, particularly the started with the project with the Hungry Ghost Festival shed, uh, where you can see here is originally the, the shed was actually in, uh, you know, just a typical uh, metal clad uh, roofing with no uh, consideration for natural lighting and ventilation. So uh, the students came in and they did a few right, exciting proposal. You know, as a student work, we encourage them to explore further. But of course, the finished work is, uh, did not have that kind of uh, um, complexity or maybe the structural, uh, uh, the, those uh, flamboyant structure that the students may propose. But I think we did the, quite a good job where we actually uh, changed the whole uh, atmosphere of the, the square where we actually uh, open up the space and also bring in natural light and ventilation. Another thing is that the, the shade now, you are, from the shade, you're actually able to uh, see the Bukit Mata Jam Hill at the backdrop as well. Okay. And then in 2016, something very important happened. Um, because MPSP signed an MOU with the Yokohama City, where they uh, agreed to actually work together in the study of um, Bukit Mata Jam. And then during that time, the, the Yokohama delegation brought in their city hall government officials uh, academicians from the universities, and then urban designers and professional architects as well. And then they even did a USM design studio based in Kementajam. And there was also uh, one town hall session organized in 2017 to gather some public opinion regarding the BM supermarket because uh, the supermarket was burned down during a fire in 2014. And then uh, the city council didn't know what to do with it. And then, so Yokohama, I think, through their influence, actually suggested that why don't they do a town hall session inviting the public to give their opinion about the, the market. So um, in subsequent years as well, in 2018, I was also involved in the second academic field trip with students, this time with the FCUC uh, college, which is the, formerly the KBU college. Okay. So this bunch of students actually work on a few sites, uh, in uh, particular the Old Temple Square, which is the, where the 150 years old temple is located. And then they also work at the remodeling of the BM supermarket. As also there's an old cinema and also a five-story commercial complex. So the students um, explore a lot of uh, adaptive reuse in their work as well. And then continuing from that, um, in 2018, uh, one eight, um, there was rumors that the supermarket may be, uh, need to be torn down for rebuilding. So we were actually, you know, a lot of concerned uh, members of the public were actually very concerned whether you know, it's actually uh, worthwhile to uh, rebuild it because this supermarket is uh, um, cast in a lot of uh, you know, common memories of the VN folks. And uh, a lot of us actually grew up uh, visiting this supermarket and below is actually the wet market. So it uh, is one of the local uh, landmarks for the BM people. So then we start to initiate uh, this BM festival as a way to actually address the issues about heritage and also pres uh, preservation of culture. So therefore then the first cultural festival was born uh, in, in, in a very quick, short uh, matter of time, a quick organizing community was actually formed to organize this uh, festival. And then also it was actually received by, uh, taught by the YBs and uh, then the link up to MPSP to actually organize the festival. And then uh, the project was very successful. And in the same year, um, Yokohama City Council through JICA, the Japan International Cooperation Agency, also uh, sponsored some of the upgrading works in the the town, especially some of the signages, which is the uh, which is to uh, improve the so-called the some of the um, streetscapes and and also uh, advising the city council to uh, put in some uh, heritage building listing. Okay, 
so that uh, the locals as well as uh, visitors can, you know, they can uh, be, be, be aware of uh, all these heritage buildings within the town. And of course, in the second year in the running, we also held the festival in the, in the same venue. And uh, we were also invited by the Georgetown uh, Chinese New Year Festival to participate in the Chinese New Year Festival in 2020. Okay. And then uh, in 2020, I actually held the third field trip uh, with the UCSI students. This time we were studying the former railway, railway station because the town is actually, uh, the railway station was an integral part of the town when it was formed as well. So I'm going to show you a little bit on that one later on when we reach that site. Okay, a brief, uh, a brief history of BM. It was formerly known as uh, Province Wellesley. So it was established about 10 years, uh, slightly later than the Penang Island. You know, in Penang Island was established by Francis Light in 1786. Then Province was established 10 years later. So you can see in the, some of the photos here, pictures here, um, which I've extracted from the Arika books. Um, from the island, you can actually see the Bukit Matajam Hill as a major landmark. And those days, the immigrants who came from other parts of the world, like China, India, uh, other parts, you know, they have to be quarantined at the Ural Jeroja. So after that, they can then move on to the island to work for a job. So a lot of the, those who can write and read, they actually remain in the island because they can get a better paid job. So those who can't normally end up in the Bukit Matajam in the Subang Pai area, because uh, those areas were designated as a farming zone by the British. So you can see some old photos where there were sugarcane mills and also tapioca mills as well. Uh, are you guys aware that uh, Batangin Street is in Chinese name is called, actually it's called Tapioca Factory Street. So Batangin Street also used to have a lot of tapioca mill as well. You can see the, 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 the diagrams on the bottom tree uh, showing the development of uh, province Vesli, uh, starting with the settlements along the river mouth where the settlers uh, came in through, uh, through boats and, and tongkangs, and subsequently, you know, they expanded the agriculture farming activities throughout the whole area. And then the third diagram shows the, the railway line that uh, came down from, came up from Taiping and then stopped over in Bukit Dajiang before ending at the Butterworth port. Okay. And then in 1886, the BM, uh, this uh, temple was established. So, until today, I think it's about almost 100 years old. But there was a tragedy happened in uh, 2019 where it was burned down due to a fire mishap. Okay, and after enjoying 100 years of prosperity, I think recent years uh, when we did a, a lot of survey in the town, we realized that there are about 35% of the shops are actually unused. That means they are vacated, meaning to say that either the, the family traditional business are closing down or the tenants are moving up as well. So we actually surveyed the whole town, which is about total about 40 acres in, in size. And then you can see here the photos uh, from the left and right. It's actually only in the, the space of four years, actually the, the shop houses were actually, the structure crumbled and then the, the wall also gave way. So even the council had to put up some temporary hoarding to prevent public from walking below the corridor just to prevent any accident. I think the issue was the, the age, is it the because of aging population or because of the urban migration? My theory is that it's more towards the urban migration because we are still not like uh, having an uh, aging population like Japan or other first world countries. But I think the, the issues is actually urban migration because, you know, um, a lot of uh, these local, local residents do not live in the shop houses anymore. When uh, they used to, you know, live upstairs and do the business downstairs, but nowadays with the establishment with uh, of a lot of housing estate, people start to move up from the town center. This happens so in also in any part, all other cities, in, including KL, like Pataling Street area, the Masi Jame area, you know, Hudu area. They used to have a lot of uh, urban population living in the town, but nowadays it's only left us uh, old folks who. You have you no know, association with the place and then they don't want to leave their, their, their place of birth. And the bottom shows also how the town was developed in the uh, 1800s towards the end of 15, 1950s, where after World War II, the town actually uh, 
uh, enjoy a lot of uh, this uh, boom uh, during that time after the Japanese surrender. So um, here also a very interesting map. That's why I'm talking about the urbanization of uh, Bukit Matajam. You can see here the two uh, Google map which, which we actually managed to retrieve. Uh, showing on the left is uh, 1980s, where the, there are a few suburban suburban uh, housing areas established outside of uh, BM town. But towards the you know 2020, you can see that it's uh, all the suburban town expanded towards the become a self-sufficient satellite township already. So therefore, the residents do not feel the need of going to the town to do their daily things like you know uh, going to banking. Maybe those days, there's only one, one main bank in the town area. And then nowadays, you can have four or five main banks in, in around the town is the, all, the, all the branches established. So therefore, the need to go to the town center has, has reduced. Maybe to, in certain days, like maybe on the weekend, they will go there to look for uh, local uh, food you know, the local food hunting, or maybe they go for the temple for prayers during certain seasons. Uh, so the, 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 the traveling, you know, the number of traveling into the town center become less uh, relevant and therefore town has lost its, uh, its, uh, this uh, traction to, the, you know, the daily life is no longer involved with the town center. So then there's a decline in the, I think, the significance of the historic core and erosion of traditional values and culture as well. So this is actually a common, uh, common phenomena in all our rural townships in all country. And so how did we start actually in 2018, which is the pivotal year? Okay, because of the, I think the fire that caused the supermarket to burn down. So I'm sure a lot of you heard of the store supermarket, right? Actually the store supermarket was started in Bukit Mataja. The mother company is called Bukit Mataja uh, BM Supermarket. So the shareholders gradually turn into uh, rename it the store. Okay, so um, so there's a lot of long history of, of this store supermarket chain as well. And the second thing is that uh, the railway station also it has a very beautiful uh, Victorian uh, cast iron uh, bridge, which was uh, forced to be taken down due to the double track railway line. And then the double track railway line also uh, relocated the uh, railway station outside of BM Town. So the cost causing the whole stretch of this uh, railway station road to uh, decay because all the shops also did not have any business from the, this uh, transportation and also movement of people also reduced uh, to that area. And another issue is uh, when the town is in decay, all the shops are closing down, you're starting to see a lot of foreign uh, workers, foreign laborers uh, flocking the town on weekends because they, a lot of them were working in the outskirts like in a pride area in Alma, uh, the, all the boy Park estate in factories area construction sites. They then take the public bus and then they will come to the town on the weekends to do their shopping, to send their money back, you know, using Western, all this Western Union to send money back to their home country and then to eat as well, to entertain themselves. So on weekends, uh, you're starting to see that you know, all the foreign laborers starting to uh, flock into the town area, something similar to Kota Raya area, where if you take a walk from the central market towards the back, you can see that's the kind of atmosphere. So it's actually quite frightening and locals then are starting to, to dread going to the town area. So we actually inherited uh, this uh, supermarket building from scratch. You know, you can see here the photos in the top in the middle, the columns are still uh, uh, the the traces of the burn marks from the fire is still in, uh, very visible here. And then, so when we rented this place, we actually had an agreement from the council that we will rent this place, not, I mean, rent for free. La. You'll use this space for the festival. We actually had to do the cleaning. We got to make sure it's actually uh, in terms of uh, barricades, you know, or people will fall down from the edge. Uh, these are the things that we have to do and uh, additional preparation work. And then we just started off as just a group of you know, 20 odd you know, working community uh, uh, where we have uh, people from all walks of life. We have artists, designers, contractors, photographers, writers, uh, reporters, even retirees. We have actually two retired teachers join us as well to be, uh, to be in the community as an advisor. So uh, we started you know, sending out, uh, putting out a poster and calling for volunteers as well to join us in this 
in this project. And then what we have is very cheap material. We only have bam bamboo and also uh, uh, pallets, you know, all recycled material, which is easy to work with and easy to construct and easy to dismantle. Okay, because we didn't have the budget to sort of like construct something that is, you know, more lasting. So uh, me and my internship team, uh, I think there are four of them, five of them, uh, quickly whip up uh, uh, some design proposals to help the community to actually uh, visualize what you want, want to build. But in the same time, it's actually uh, not everything is final. It's not cast in stone because we actually intend to actually build together, you know, construct it together with the volunteers and the local community. I think that's a fun part and also that's an important part of uh, placemaking. It's not that you design everything in a perfect condition and then you get a contractor to build and then deliver to the site. You know, it's actually the other way around. We actually allow a certain improvisation by the locals uh, to actually express themselves and also get more involvement from the locals as well. This, uh, I'll show you later how we did it. So during the preparation, we also have a help of one carpenter. He's a volunteer to be the chief carpenter, and then the rest are all amateurs. And then I just, you know, I just jump in on and here and there to actually assist and give some advice because uh, mainly it's relying on my group of uh, interns working together with the volunteers. So we start to use the bamboos, you know, cut in different sizes. Some we ordered because there's one local bamboo shop uh, and rotten shop there. They can supply, we cut bamboo to the sizes you want. So actually we ordered the bamboo according to the size we want. So some are the whole bamboo trunk, some are actually uh, bamboo slices only. And we are also inspired by this Hungry Ghost, this, uh, uh, this uh, statue, where it's actually all handmade. Uh, this is the biggest uh, Hungry Ghost statue in the whole of Malaysia. Not the tallest, but the biggest, and I think the most beautiful uh, you could have ever uh, seen. And you notice that the color, we also actually try to relate to this festival. So in terms of color, uh, we actually buy this uh, color paper from a local stationery shop. And uh, they just assemble and then uh, improvise, you know, uh, make it uh, beautiful uh, as per their, their wish. So along the way, uh, we actually work day and night. Uh, one week before the festival, we have to work relentlessly day and night. And then uh, we have volunteers coming in and out. Some are helping, some are only coming in after work. So they, they come in after work and then they start uh, helping us from six o'clock until midnight. And then they go back to work again. So you can see a lot of uh, volunteers actually without calling them, they just, you know, uh, come in and then just offer their help. So some, they are good in painting. They will help to paint, paint up some murals within the space, uh, to decorate the space. And some are helping to put up the, the posters and all that. So you can also see that there's, there's one uh, on the bottom right, there's one Bangladeshi uh, workers helping my carpenter to assemble a kind of like installation. And then he was so happy and I think he's so proud of the work that he, he in fact, he also posed in front of the installation. So, so the night, you know, the final night before the run-up to the finale, we actually advertised a poster by having a digital projection over these uh, shop houses, uh, trying to attract people and also trying to uh, promote it because during that time, there's already the Hungry Ghost Festival and you can see the cars are lining up along the street as well. So people actually come in for the prayers day and night. So they are aware of this. And also, I think uh, we have the help of the social media to promote as well. So words spread out very fast. So when it opened the next day, it, it's actually a hit. And uh, we actually had uh, unprecedented uh, visitors of about 30,000 people from the local community. Yeah. So we actually have, you know, uh, we set up a pop up uh, stage also for uh, performance from traditional dance to pop songs as well. And then all the VIPs also came for the opening ceremony. Then we had, you know, uh, face painting for the Chinese opera. People can actually pay and get, get their face painted. Uh, there are some uh, dance and also photography competition. So these three models actually uh, part of the models for the photography competition. So they actually follow them walking around the town area to take photos. And then this is my favorite thing. Uh, uh, one of the opera singers dressed in uh, this one Kong, God of War 
costume and then posing in front of this uh, so-called time tunnel. Uh, this time tunnel, actually, we use the map we uh, got from this uh, Subang Cry Stories books from Arika Books. And then we actually exhibited all these old photos of Subang Cry along this uh, bamboo structure. So we call it the time tunnel. It's uh, kind of uh, interesting because you can see the contrast between the traditional uh, costume versus the very contemporary structures, as well as the uh, concrete structure at the backdrop. And then we, uh, because I'm also uh, very interested in urban sketching, so I invited a lot of urban sketches, especially the USK Penang, to come and uh, join for some uh, sketching uh, outing as well. And then this was the works of my students who were exhibited during the exhibition. So actually, we want to make it as a, you know, become a public exhibition so that the general public can also be aware of what is adaptive fields and what are the potentials of the properties in case you know, there are some shop house owners. You know, he can see that the, the possibility of you know, the shop houses being converted into something else which uh, has a more meaningful uh, use rather than uh, demolish and wait for, uh, for it to be rebuilt. And then we have a lot of public sharing, uh, storytelling, because we actually put up this uh, map of Bukit Mandajam and people start starting to come and, you know, they actually, uh, right now there are phone numbers and what's the name and the name of the shops as well. So we actually collected a lot of uh, local contacts as well. So we start, we, we hope that we can do uh, this, uh, all this compilation uh, of this local uh, history as well. And you can see that we are not just building uh, exhibition space, we're actually building a community. Yeah, see, uh, at the end, these are all the volunteers and community posing together in front of this staircase. This staircase is, is very interesting because it actually has a kind of a classical feel where the first flight, uh, uh, there's a three flights on the lower left, lower area on the front and left and right, and then uh, stop at the middle before you continue go up to the top. It's like, a, you know, those... Uh, Victorian, Georgian uh, uh, buildings where there's a central uh, landing to, to, to proceed to the upper floor. Yeah, uh, subsequently for the, after the first festival, I think we got some funding from uh, YBs and also uh, some other bodies to actually put up this uh, artwork project. Um, it's actually a, an old pedestrian street uh, located in the town where it's linking the, one of the uh, this main road towards the uh, this uh, railway station. So it was it used to be a very busy street because those days uh, the students after the you know the Jishin school students after the school they would actually take a walk through this pedestrian street towards the bus stations located in and around the town area. There were actually a few bus stations located and scattered around the town area. So that uh, in fact it's good because then you have a lot of human movement uh, from the one point to another rather than having a centralized bus terminal where it's only a collect bus at one central location. So here you, you actually disperse out the circulation in around the whole town. So you can see here from 19, uh, 2019 when it started, uh, gradually also uh, there are uh, inquiries for or rent the, the dilapidated shops and convert into uh, F&B's outlet like cafes and you can see at the bottom right also, there's one barbecue shops actually uh, started operating uh, early this year. But due to COVID, I hope they can survive. And we used uh, some of the winning uh, entries of the photography exhibition to decorate this corridor. And when you lit up at night, it's really, really beautiful. So these are works of Akan BM members. It's not purely uh, our work. You know, we have, uh, we have designers, we have contractors who chip in our ideas and working together to achieve something very meaningful. So it's not just a one-man show, but actually it's more of a community effort. And uh, the second year in the running, we want to address this about these shop houses, which is crumbling down. So you can see the posters also, there's a difference. From the first year poster, poster where we actually focus on the supermarket, we also have the supermarket at the backdrop plus all the shop houses in front of it. So something like, uh, you know, bring out the message that, you know, our town is not just the landmarks, but also all the streetscapes as well, and all the shops as well. They are part of our, uh, this uh, heritage. So the second year, the events is even more comprehensive and we actually uh, widen the activity from 
the supermarket to other landmarks in the town so that we encourage human movement in around. It's like a carnival festival in the town where you can walk from one uh, event to another. So we have, uh, as shown here, we have uh, quite, a, quite a lot of uh, new activities in the second year. Um, of course, the main uh, focus is still the supermarket and we wanted to recreate the so-called the street scene of Bukit Matajam. So we actually did a lot of research of the old shop houses and trying to sort of get out the essence of this facade and then we try to uh, recreate a so-called a similar chrome. That means it's like a simulate of the tra traditional street of the, the Bukit Matajam and put it up here. Of course, the color spacing is less than six meters. It's actually four meters only. So the scale of the shops is actually smaller. Yeah. And uh, we actually had to prepare a, a few months early. In fact, in the second year, we also start to actually develop, you know, art and craft unique to the place. Like uh, we get artists to draw the, draw the landmarks, draw the significant uh, cultural uh, elements. We also engage uh, one uh, model maker to actually make a model of this uh, old shop house belonging to the first chief minister of uh, uh, Penang, uh, Tan Si Wong Pauni's old residence. And then we also have uh, crafters and uh, uh, designers who make this merchandise, uh, converting the hungry ghost, which is to a lot of cases, which is very scary. We make it into a kind of like a, a, a game set so that they can play. They can also uh, do uh, this uh, stucco painting over it. And we had more volunteers in the second year, the students from the schools as well helping us. So we actually had to assemble all these laser cut uh, panels uh, and then uh, paint them and then hoist, that, hoist it up and then put it on the frame and then to, to uh, reconstruct this uh, street all within uh, one time. So as we built, uh, luckily I had the help of, uh, you know, again, uh, I think we have about eight interns during that time. So we actually start to build it and towards the end, uh, we had also the help of uh, one calligraphy artist who helped us to draw this very nice uh, uh, logo for the stalls. And when we had dinner break, we actually the local uh, restaurant would actually serve us for free because they know that we are doing something for the city, for the town. So they serve us for free, the free char siu rice, the free chicken rice, you name it, you, they'll just serve you because they know you are volunteers. So we actually, uh, the top left photo you can see here, we are taking our dinner together. And then the right hand side, we had also members who, who helped to do promotion in the local market and then uh, shouting out in the market, you know, about this event. And then the, the, the two days before the event, we also have a, a news uh, press release by uh, the YB together with us to promote this event as well. So yeah, I was very glad that we had uh, a lot of uh, good uh, working interns helping out in the festival. And this continued to be our uh, company's uh, culture where we uh, involve uh, our interns with a local community project as well. At least one project for each of them during their tenure. And this is the final night before the opening. So finally getting ready for this uh, opening. Okay, of course this year, uh, the second year, we have more activities. Like, uh, for example, having uh, this uh, walking tour, which uh, Rakan BM continue to offer this tour to visiting tourists or local residents who want to know more about their town history. So we actually have uh, one tour guide in our community where we, uh, we actually uh, do guided tours with a, a small paid, uh, token fee. Okay? Then you can see here cultural performance in different parts of the town during the festival, even uh, uh, this is a Chinese tea drinking ceremony session as well. So uh, locals can know how to drink, you know, they teach you how to uh, serve Chinese tea in a traditional way in along one of the old streets, which is the BM Art Walk. So very interesting. And then we also have art competitions uh, open from, for kids as well as adults. So you can see here some of the very beautiful work done by the local students from primary school to uh, secondary school. They have to do uh, sketching rather than just painting from, from, uh, based on pictures. And then we have uh, one of the oldest contestants. This uncle, he's more than 70 years old. He said that he wants to support this uh, 
festival and then he participated in the painting comp drawing competition. Although he didn't win, but I, we were very grateful that he came to, to support us. And then the sketchings uh, from the previous year, uh, from the Urban Sketchers fans, we then uh, make it into prints and then we actually exhibit that in the, in, the, in the venue. And then we even have an art exhibition. So all these artists are from, made mostly from Penang region, as well as a few from KL. You know, their works are actually all based on Bukit Matajam. You cannot paint the, you know, the KLCC Twin Tower, you cannot paint the, the, uh, this uh, Pula Langkawi, nor you, can, you cannot paint the Batu Kefiu. You have to paint based on the Bukit Matajam, place, people, and culture. So here you are. These are all the very beautiful works done by the artists. And then we had a uh, public sharing as well. We have delegates from Yokohama uh, came to for their support, as well as one representative from uh, Ping City, Penang. And then we have delegates from Taiwan, uh, the academics. And then we have some friends, uh, including uh, this uh, famous uh, Golden Horses, uh, uh, winner of Golden Horses, best uh, new director, Chong Ke An, came to do his sharing on collecting uh, local dialects as well. He's, uh, he's expert in local dialects and local folk songs. And then we even hold a, a symposium yeah, uh, in, the, in the school, one of the Jisin school auditorium, uh, where we have about 50 attendants from the local public. And I think it's important to share knowledge. It's not just having a festival and having a few good factor. I think the, the ideas and the knowledge has to pass on uh, to um, the stakeholders, you know, the participants. So uh, thanks to uh, some, some of the supporters who came and speakers who came all the way from KL came to support uh, for this symposium. And we also uh, have, uh, have the help of uh, MAPE who sponsored the t-shirt. So I would like to say thank you again to MAPE. Yeah, it's, uh, you sponsor once, but you can get the continuous advertisement from me whenever I talk about uh, this uh, BM festival. Okay, so these are the speakers, and including one uh, Ho Jin Ke, I Ho, who talk about uh, converting the back street into uh, beautifying as a public space. And also architect Tan, uh, Tan Hep Hong uh, is a conservation architect who helped to uh, re, uh, re, re, rebuild this uh, BM tem uh, Pekong temple due to the fire. And also one speaker is uh, Jekul Lee, he's the founder of Kajang Heritage Center. Center. Unfortunately, he passed away early this year. So I'm actually very in debt to them because he came all the way without you know, asking for any uh, token of uh, or speaker fee at all. He just came to support and share their knowledge with all of us in, in the Tanja. And then to me, I think I also did the sharing during that, that night. And to me, I think the successful factor is uh, it has to be, you know, thinking all this culture, creativity, community, and commerce. Uh, one thing is lacking that we don't have this commerce connection and connection where we continue to do festival. What happens next is the I think the sustainability issue has to come into play and we have to really think harder uh, because we cannot continue to do festival uh, year in and year out. So uh, the finale, uh, we also have a art and craft market where we use the art walk as an art and craft market. Uh, we, uh, continue from the BM market, then we shift the activity, activity to the BM art walk as well. And then I was very touched because this, this is the only first time I see that the back alleys of Bukit Matajam has been turned into a lively art and craft street. Uh, plus all the local uh, art and craft together with some help from uh, the farmer's market people as well. So uh, another in fun uh, project what we did was at the treasure hunt where we used a, this uh, local map created and then we link up all these uh, traditional traits in the treasure hunt. So the treasure hunt uh, participants can uh, learn about the local traits where they have to uh, comb through these uh, old streets and alleys uh, to look for the answers in their treasure hunt hints and questionnaires. So we actually play like an amazing race, you know. This 90 years, years old uncle, his, uh, his, his, his home and his shops, we, we use it as a starting point and ending point so that all the participants have to get him to sign off the answer sheets when they, when they, when they come, come back for the, 
submission. So it's like the end of the amazing race. Yeah. And this shop is very interesting. You can see the signage here. It has four languages. Uh, Jawi, you have the Chinese, you have the English, and also the, the Tamil, I think. So, and the phone number is only, what number? 69. So imagine how old is these shops. And then I had the, the fun also to putting up some of my art collection. Uh, I've kept in the store and finally have a good chance to exhibit it because all this artwork showing the traditional shop houses of Malaysia, uh, some are from Victor Chin, Chin Konyit, and, and also one contemporary artist, Kan Si Hoi, who, who painted on this, uh, uh, this uh, Jalan Sultan uh, due to the, this uh, art movement in Jalan Sultan. Uh, Satan, Sultan, uh, Jalan Sultan. Also, I took his work and put it up here to show a contrast of these uh, traditional shops versus this uh, traditional uh, earthenware and also clay, clay. It's very nice because I think put it in the context, it becomes something very in beautiful to look at. And I think what I'm trying to address here is that this 90 years old living heritage, I don't think we have much time left. Huh? So if you don't address this, I think it, all this will disappear very soon. So what happens next after the festival is, uh, you know, it receives a brief review from the news and public uh, media as well. But whether the support from the state government uh, is uh, still remain unclear. And then uh, this uh, formal residence is still unrepaired. So we're trying to uh, do an appeal to the, all the relevant authorities to take action to restore this building because it's also one of the heritage of the town. And uh, showing here is uh, some glimpse of uh, some revival which is taking place. Uh, on the left is uh, photos that we took during the 2015 student field trip. Uh, you can see here the four shop houses during that time. And then recently it was re restored and then a lot of uh, new f and starting to uh, mushroom and spring up. Uh, in, in certain parts of the town, especially this area here. But still, I think the overall change is still remain to uh, be seen. And of course, the, the spiritual center, the BM temple, was also being restored and hope to open next year to the new, uh, to the new, you know, the, the temple square will be restored as well. So uh, that it, it will become a new, a landmark as well, a new landmark as a as of, uh, the town. And then we're also working with the uh, local YBs to actually uh, upgrade the streetscape, you know, uh, because currently now the streetscape, the signages is just horrible. Some are uh, actually totally close up the fenestration and the facade of the, the very beautiful shops. Some are actually replaced with aluminum windows. So we are trying to, you know, encourage the stakeholders here, the owners, uh, that uh, they may actually chip in certain percentage for the renovation and the, the rest are sponsored by uh, the other uh, stakeholders like the temple, uh, temple community and then the city council. Uh, but still, uh, this work is uh, still remain as a proposal stage. Huh? So I think it's one important message I want to come, uh, bring across is that you know, BM is still a, a living heritage town, so it's worth uh, preserving. So a little bit about placemaking. Uh, let me just catch. So oh, despite all the work, just try to put it in the more of a theoretical perspective. You know, I'm not talking about big theories, big ideas, but uh, just some introduction and influences of placemaking. I think important two important figure is uh, uh, Jane Jacobs and this William White, and um, you. You can download uh, also the um, these projects for public space spaces from the internet and get to know a bit more about what is uh, space making, you know, how what is functions and it's actually connecting people and uh, with the places and also uh, we trying to look at it, you know, physically, culturally, and social identities that define the place. And these are all the key principles of place making. Um, you can actually uh, download and study for yourself. But basically, the, the gist of it is that, you know, um, it's, a, it's a faster way to respond to a certain urban condition, especially like, you know, not necessarily has to be a dilapidated building. It could be a, a street or a certain unused urban space. 
that uh, can be improved uh, for the community to use, then it can be a, a kind of a little project that you can start off. And it's normally it's a small scale where it's, uh, it can be faster and uh, uh, lighter and cheaper as well. And just to put it in the, the application, uh, say for example, you go to a city, you know, say New York, normally you go to the city, you know, it's fun because it has many destinations within the city where you can visit. And then within each des destination, normally you have a lot of things to do as well. It's like going to the, uh, why people like to go to central market and uh, that it, surrounding the area because you can visit the, some of the, you know, monuments, you can try the traditional food and buy some, you know, the, uh, the, the, the certain uh, goods that you cannot find uh, in your normal suburban town area. So, and also maybe uh, the smell, the looks, the, you know, a lot of things that actually is, is actually is fun and, and, and creating the, the social interaction within the space. So these are very basic ideas and basic principles that you can, you can, you can do. It's, it's not a really uh, 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 hardcore theory. And also these are like this, um, intro introducing um, Christopher Alexander, which I think is also, when I read his book, I think his, his idea is aligned to pacemaking as well because he's uh, promoting design uh, using human experience and human interaction rather than uh, the big theory, that kind, of, uh, uh, that kind of approach. And if you look at you know, some of his uh, uh, pacemaking sort of uh, exercise, uh, uh, theories and, and techniques, uh, like for example, item 45, item 100 and 124, it's about human interaction and how people feel comfortable and how, how you can and even the public spaces. So it's, it has a similar ideas aligned to face making concept. And just, uh, this is just a simple example in Japan where they turn a normal uh, road into a pedestrianized uh, streets on certain weekends where public can come out, come out and uh, have activities. So I think you've got to look at different levels of your this uh, organization in, in terms of society, like your, yourself, your family, and the community. So just putting in the better prospect, perspective, your, the social organization versus space, I think, uh, you know, like as an individual, you have your family, and then you live in the neighborhood, and your neighborhood is part of the community. And in the traditional uh, spaces, or so-called spaces which, which is very good for interaction. Normally these spaces overlap, overlapping each other. Uh, and then it's uh, like a landmark, you know, most of it are landmarks. But uh, as we move towards, uh, you know, gated gutter community and suburbanization of our city, we actually have uh, uh, our, our family and our neighbor actually get disjointed and we don't get any connection or in terms of sharing the space with the community as well. And we don't, you know, a lot of community also don't feel the sense of place at all, sense of community, because they're getting more isolated. And also because of the digitalization of our space, we don't need to go out, you know, sometimes to buy things. We actually can order food from outside to deliver to your house. So uh, place making in Malaysia, I just taking one very crude example, because this is something that I saw in one of the towns that I visited, passed by. Uh, where they actually try to use a mural to beautify this street. Uh, not sure about your judgment, but to me, it's, it's not very well thought. It's like a, just a, trying to achieve a certain instant gratification. You know, I think it's, it's done up just to show off you know, that they have done some work. Uh, not sure about the detail of the mural, whether it's, uh, it's the quality of the work is nice. Even the petai then um, uh, this uh, street lighting also become so kitsch. I think uh, we could do better than that. And of course, there are some better examples, uh, more sensible ones. Of course, many of you uh, know about this place. And I'll show you also one of my own urban farm later on. So I think an overview, just, uh, you know, must is mushrooming over Malaysia, but most of the placemaking team are working in isolation although they are interlinked, but they are working within the, their own comfort zone, meaning to say that they don't, they don't actually interact with the, you know, each other, mainly working within the uh, uh, one location. And today, I think most, most of the placemaking 
topics and issues have been uh, more uh, promoted by MIP more in uh, via their pacemaking Malaysia division. And then I think uh, only a handful of architects are involved, including landscape architects as well, you know who. And then I think it's lacking participation from the architectural fraternity and the institute. Lah. And uh, to note uh, one important uh, is, uh, is, uh, is actually in 2019, where there's uh, this uh, new village division led by uh, Choi Yi Lin from, uh, she's actually under the MPKK Kamong Baru division. She, she was heading that. And then she uh, had a symposium uh, in Putrajaya. And then during that time also, there's uh, a lot of uh, new village uh, community came to the symposium. I think it's a good start. And then subsequently in 2021, uh, she again uh, worked with the Taiwan uh, Taipei Economic and Cultural Office, actually uh, organized this uh, new village vision contest where we have about 76 entries from the whole country to, uh, to enter this, uh, this so-called idea competition. So overall, it's still lacking support from the government sectors uh, and lacking an overall vision. So and, and a lot of approaches like they, they just build community halls rather than really working with the, the so they just build buildings because it's easy to achieve a certain target, certain KPI, get it done, and then you, you move to the next project. You know? But I think pacemaking is not like that. It's actually you need a lot of long-term commitment and patience working with the local community. So what can PEM do with regards to this? I think we can consider like maybe form, form a sub-community to, to encourage this activity, uh, so provide training for the members as well as also maybe uh, having uh, placemaking as one of our PEM, having awards in the awards or having this organizing uh, placemaking competition, I think it will be very useful if you want to uh, move along this line. And this is the actually the talking about the competition. There were 76 teams and then these were the 25 teams which were shortlisted in the final. So you can see here their projects are uh, all spread over whole Malaysia. Uh, unfortunately, it's only in Peninsula Malaysia. And the nature of their work is actually very interesting from environmental green project to community environment empowerment and then uh, local branding, local products or uh, green tourism, uh, you name it. They are quite a, a variety of work. So all related to placemaking and building up local community resilience. But of course, overall in Malaysia, we still have a lot of, uh, most of the key cities have its own placemaking notes uh, with uh, each of this group. Like Penang, we have Georgetown Festival. KL, we have in the core, core zone, we have a few people working. Uh, with the, you know, in, within the Pataling Street district as well. And Sarawak, you have in Kuching. Um, I think there's one in like this Sarawak Cultural Village, Green Forest Music Festival, and also the Senior One Festival, which is actually quite interesting. If you Google that, you can find it's uh, converted into a cowboy town during the festival. Very interesting. You can take a, take a check with uh, the Google. Okay. So I just, just list out these are the major grocery of Placemaking in Malaysia, the who's who in Malaysia who are actually championing placemaking. Of course, first of all, is Team City, which is under the Kazana, the government who manage the allocation of this uh, funding. And Placemaking Malaysia under MIP. And this, uh, I was talking about Village Vision Community, uh, led by Choi Yi Ling. And you can check out their Facebook as well. And then also another one is the, the school I'm teaching, UCSI, led by uh, Associate Professor Theo. Ji Kiong is also uh, one of the, I think he was Taiwan, uh, Taiwan trained architect. So yes, he's also the academic connection with the Taiwanese uh, place making uh, um, experts. And then also Kajang Heritage Center uh, by Mr. Lee Kim Sin, uh, the late Mr. Lee Kim Sin. Kota Ling Street Heritage House, Tonket An, Lost Chance, Elab in Ipoh, and also Moa River Times, uh, one of the emerging is making a group in a more area, more river regions. Okay, so I have some books as well. I've read uh, some are in, actually I bought in Taiwan. So a lot of ideas actually came from Taiwan, but of course you have to digest everything. It's not like you can take it and use it raw, uh, yeah, straight away. And this book also translated from a Japanese author, which is very famous. So to him, placemaking is a 
community design talk about people. It's not just space and place, but also community. I think that's an important part. And then this is book by uh, Dr. Wang, which was also one of the speaker in the recent uh, competition. And he talked about how people can actually uh, make a place, you know, convert into a, from a space into a place. And he's uh, talking about one example. It's like uh, this uh, community, uh, this uh, management office of uh, the community. So where they turn the community, community management office into a community center where the residents can then, instead of just having uh, administrative use, they, they turn into exhibition, they turn into activity area. Uh, so from 2.0, it changed to 3.0. And the idea is, is that, you know, using the people as a focus, not the space as a focus, starting design from the needs of the, the people rather than the needs of the space. And then with the, you know, giving it more flexibility, so allowing the end users to actually shape their space and shape their place and you know you not have to uh, not necessarily have to have all the fixed furniture you can actually have more loose furniture and they can actually uh, arrange it according to their, their needs so the idea is, is that from place making i think the traditional way of designing like a lot of architects is that we actually start started with the project is uh, as our main focus you know we build the buildings and then we we have a preset program and then we allow the we have to force the users to actually follow the space that we have designed. But placemaking actually turns out another way around. Actually, we start with the people first. What, who are the users and then what do they do? And then only then the space will then come into play to actually accommodate the program. So it's actually a, a, a opposite direction of thinking. And then uh, what can we do from assimilation? You know, uh, rather than just uh, having a feel good factor, I think. Apart from benchmarking our placemaking objective uh, with the SDG goals, which also I think we have to do more cross cross cultural placemaking because I feel that as Malaysians we actually are lacking in this part. And seen that seen in the photo here, this is taken in this Jalan Sultan community art movement. Uh, it was a massive protest against MRT where they uh, forced to acquire some of the uh, buildings along Jalan Sultan for for the MRT project, and then. Seen here is all the uh, you know uh, Malaysians from different religious and cultures uh, having a common prayer for the success of this project during the protest. Uh, so that gave me a, a huge inspiration. I think we Malaysians should uh, also not just doing the SDG five piece, but also going for a multicultural approach. And I myself also started one place making project uh, last year during the lockdown where we started a, an urban farm within our condo community. So uh, I just draw up the layout and discuss with the members and each of them have their own input. You know, they built, they built uh, using pallet to a uh, composting pit. And then we built a shed to put, keep our gardening tools. And then I think uh, one of our neighbors, especially a retired uncle, he was there all the time because he has the most time uh, we have. And, we started with this, uh, just a small group and slowly grow into 60 odd families within the condo. So, and also we in, uh, add in some community art project, like the kids can then paint on the tree trunks and decorate the space. And then this uncle also helped a lot with uh, having some echo uh, program and teaching the kids how to plant and how to grow and how to draw. And then we actually harvesting a lot of happiness. It's not just the the vegetables, but actually a lot of happiness created the achievement and goals. Huh? We actually can achieve more than half of this place making objective that is uh, listed out in, in the booklet. Another I did in 2017 was uh, just for fun uh, under the, my gallery. So I did uh, actually uh, just we call it the Sunday up where I invited all my street photography friends and my urban sketches friends to sketch and shoot at this uh, Batu Lima market. Because the reason I like this is because this market uh, is a, it has a food court in front where Chinese, Malays, Indians, everyone come and dine together in the food court. You know, it's hardly in uh, any space in now in KL you can find that the all races are, have no barrier against each other. They actually dine and share the same table. Look at, look at the top left photo here. 
actually are seen here is uh, having a breakfast together with the uh, Indian and Malay fans. So there's a this uh, fixed chairs and tables of six per, per table, and then people just coming in and out and share the table. You know, it's, of course now it's the COVID, you you can't share the table uh, like like used to be. And when we actually roll up these Sunday out events, uh, I put up a map of this Jalan, Jalan Ipoh area because it was undergoing massive uh, changes due to MRT line two. So a lot of landmarks were torn down the petrol station, the old police uh, police pondok, and some of the old uh, ship, uh, so, so called the workshop, car workshop also have to be taken down to make way for the MRT infrastructure. So I put up this map in front of the entrance to the market. So all the public will then ask questions, why you put up this? And I'll tell them, you know, this, this is what's happening in Jalan Ipoh. Uh, are you aware that this is happening? And then where do you stay? And so people start to talk about where they stay and why they, why they, why they, you know, I asked them, where are you from? And some of them actually came from Kepong all the way here for the, for the, for the coffee. So you find, you can find more uh, photos from the, this, uh, my art gallery, Facebook, uh, Daily Art Space Sunday Out, where you can see more photos. So uh, our urban sketches fans also uh, use the, you know, these uh, sweet scapes to paint. And then we have one urban sketcher who can play violin. And then she started playing violin along the street. It's like a become very nice, you know, because normally you wouldn't find this kind of atmosphere in, in your daily life. So, and some of the urban, uh, this uh, shoot, uh, street photographers fan took some very nice pictures of the, all the people from the market as well. You know, people from different races try to make a living and working very hard to serve the, everyone with their food. And then uh, one notable project that I was also involved and participate is the this uh, Pataling Street uh, Heritage House project where uh, Chong uh, used to do it. I think he has been doing it for the past 10 years. So uh, it's a more of a festival carnival. Uh, we have it uh, during Chinese New Year or during the uh, Mid-Autumn Festival. So I was also teaching some of the visitors. Uh, most of them are tourists. Too bad that uh, locals don't come and enjoy. Most of, most of the participants uh, you can see here are actually foreign tourists who, who came and then uh, they do some painting and we taught them and then like an art jamming kind of, it's quite fun. So some reflections of my pace making journey as experience, I think I'll just summarize with a few sentences. La. I think it's I definitely it's fun and worthwhile and meaningful. And if you ask me, I think no regrets at all because I think working something with your hometown where you grew up is something very meaningful and actually touched the deepest part of my, my heart. You know, it's like, it's compared to, of course, completing a, a, a huge project and in, in terms of a commercial project, uh, the monetary return is different, but I think uh, the sense of, the, it has a different sense of uh, satisfaction. And then uh, when you participate in this kind of community project, you as a role of designer also change because you have to allow the community to get involved as well and, and in, encourage them to, you know, to express themselves. This is where you actually build up this community resilience and a sense of community so that you know, they also, you know, not just uh, uh, appreciating the heritage, but also appreciating the, the feel good factor um, uh, between the community members. And you slowly then you get to understand the nature of the community and the issues about urban sport and how we can tackle that. I think we, sometimes we have to go for the soft approach rather than you know, uh, start. We're always looking at expanding our city. Like like uh zone uh KL area like uh Udu area you know there's a lot of underutilized uh, infrastructure and buildings as well. This can be uh, turned into if you can turn into a livable uh, cuisine in the KL. I think it would be a very nice things to do as well. You know, in I think we have seen a lot of this example overseas, but we haven't started doing this in Malaysia. And then moving forward, can this be a new form? I think. A lot of young architects uh, actually were, were, were waiting that, you know, what, what can we do with, uh, you know, working with the so-called more of the rural and regional area rather than, you know, uh, all of the young architects are trying to look for jobs in KL uh, or, the, or the big cities like Penang, Johor Bahru. I think uh, there's a chance that you can actually uh, have a new uh, practice arena because you can work in a smaller uh, place with, and you are actually part of the community. 
community where you actually feel the same pulse as the community. It's not like we're working in big cities like KL where the projects just remain as a project. Once you deliver, deliver the project, you, you move on to the project, you know. Yeah. So community design also requires a, a, a very deep understanding and local knowledge of the place and people. So therefore, you can develop your own architecture, uh, vocabulary, and language, which is unique to the place, which is something that you, 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 you have to stay there long enough in order to know about all these intrinsic values. And I'm sure this will become a new arena for young architects and designers who want to you know, migrate from urban centers back to hometown, or maybe you have found a second home where your new kampong is to uh, start something there. You know, not necessarily that there will be uh, works in only in KL, but there will be works in other sm smaller towns. If you spend more time working on it, I think you can, you can do something very meaningful there also. So for me, myself also, after uh, involving all this space making, I also built up a good uh, repertoire of works in Bukit Matajang. And for me, I, after this um, experience, I also starting to involve uh, place making elements in my project, even in the KL projects also, I'm starting to apply it, you know, and also I have also my own vision of uh, Bukit Matajang. I said it at 20, 20, 20, 30. So for the next 10 years, I hope to build up a good repertoire of works which is uh, particular for Bukit Matajang. So to date, I've already done a few and we have a few under construction from not just housing, you have medical clinics, you have factories, you can have also a container, uh, this, uh, this uh, f &B park, you can build temples, you can, uh, you can also restore old buildings as well. So it's quite, quite fun and you, you can't find this, this, uh, this such a rich uh, amount of work, you know, if you still stay in uh, big cities like KL. So if you have a chance, do consider that. So there's the end of my sharing. So uh, these are some, some of my contacts. If you're interested, you can follow me. And then also you can write to me as well for any private things or certain things that you want to ask me. Ask me, yeah. Okay. So I'll pass the pattern back to uh, Dexter? Hey, Alan. Hey, thanks, Alan. Um, it's fascinating to see your efforts to bring life to a struggling town. And also, at the same time, uh, yeah, to see all the fruits of your harvest, uh, of your, all, all the, the, the vegetables that you've been uh, uh, harvesting, you know, turn into culinary delights. Uh. <laughs> um, it also seems like a bit of homecoming of sorts to be involved and also to reconnect with your hometown. And we see a progression of chain of events which led to your involvement in placemaking of Bukit Matadam Town. So tell us, how, how do you get involved with uh, Rakan BM? Yeah, I think it started with uh, this uh, Yulan Square where I was <clears throat> invited to design this, uh, this so-called the shape yeah. for them. And then through the involvement, I get to know more of this, all these local association people. Yeah. And get to know what's happening in the town. Because normally when I go back, I'll just uh, stay for one or two days and uh, visit my parents. And then most of the works are outside of PM town, like a factory or commercial projects, you know, or over the island side. So I hardly uh, spend time and... Uh, observing what's happening in the town. You know, you just go there for the makan, go for the famous chakui <laughs> and then you go already. But during the time, I think 2014, 2015, are starting to, to stay longer and observe. And this is, this is where I noticed that the town actually needs a lot of help, you know, because it's actually lying, dying a slow death. Okay. Yeah. Um, but but how, how was it formed? You know, the, the Rakan BM, uh, collaboration or collaborative is it a, a loose kind of collaboration or do you have you know is it more structured you know how, how, how was it formed and uh, what was the um, brainchild or what was the tipping point that uh, started this oh let's do Rakan BM you know what, what was yeah. the, what was the uh, behind the scenes story the rumours are when the rumours saying that the, the market need, uh, will be torn down for rebuilding so then a lot of us actually 
came forward and then we formed a, a, a community, committee to, to start the festival. So there was, it was not registered yet, you know, it was just a loose working group. But subsequently, when it's over, then we decided that we should form an NGO because with an NGO, then uh, it's easier to also to apply for grants and funding from the relevant bodies and also public sponsorship. So that's how it started. Yeah. Okay. So uh, how does one get involved in uh, place making as a beginner? You know? maybe, maybe this this talk of yours might have inspired people that like, you know, hey, I want to do a place making a, a collaboration or, or initiative in my hometown or somewhere. Uh, you know, yeah. how do you get? How, how do you start something like? This? I think you can do an assessment on where you live. Like uh, just now, I have this uh, diagram. Uh, and also, you know, you can start with a small project like maybe an urban farm group. You know, you look at where you live and where you, what, what are the interesting part of your the place, you, 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 your daily life, you know, maybe it's a, a local market or maybe it's a little uh, urban park near your, near your housing area where uh, all the locals like to gather there, they bring the kids there to play, you know, and starting some, some neighbors maybe starting to actually do uh, little farming uh, pots in front of their, in their housing, then you can invite them to be your, you know, your start, starting group. And then uh, start small, you know, you don't have to start very big and, and just do it, you know. You don't, you don't need a lot of um, money because like this urban farming, actually we started with zero fund. We get all this donation alerts. We have members who know some uh, a warehouse owner. So we just get some alert from him and then uh, neighbors starting to donate their plants, you know, because we have a lot of neighbors who were planting, who started to do their planting uh, vegetables in their balconies during the lockdown. So they, each of them contribute their vegetables, seeds, seedlings and, 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 and plants in the urban farm. Yeah. So, but, how, but how do you share? Do, do you share only with the participants? Uh, how, how is your urban farming? Uh, how, well, how well, you well, luckily, uh, it's not too many people so uh, we managed to share uh, with, with not, without any quarrel and I think we, 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 we practice a, a, a good restriction as well where we, we play uh, we, we don't you know don't don't when it's put up in sharing uh, in the group chat uh, we just come down and then just take a sufficient portion for ourselves sometimes we, we just don't take it we allow other other neighbors to take the share as well yeah like so so far there's no no quarrel, right. but I think if it's too big, growing to be too big, then you have a problem. I think we, we use this uh, vegetables as just a supplement for our daily meal. It's not that like you need to rely on every in every meals, you know. Some of it are actually spices like pandan leaf or chili padi or, or, or uh, down kasom where you want to cook a certain nyonya, uh, nyonya curry, then you use it. So it's not, it's not like the daily greens that you need to rely on this. Okay. Uh, we'll take a few questions. Oh, the questions have started uh, rolling in. Uh, one question from uh, Dei Xiaoqin. Uh, what uh, is or are the biggest challenges you face for the BN projects? For example, volunteers, funding, timeline, publicity, sustainability, etc. What was the biggest challenges you face? Uh, there, are, there are a few challenges. I think you asked me the biggest, uh, I think from which group, uh, depending on what group or what role you play. For example, I, I was a curator for the festival. So I had to organize the, the venue, design the venue, and then arrange with the, the working group to, to build up the, 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 the spaces. So for me, it's like the challenge is whether we can get enough funding to, to have enough material. So a lot of times, actually, I, I, we rely a lot on local resources. You know, for example, even the signages, we, we don't have to spend money to print out. We get a local calligrapher. He can actually write all these signages for, for us very, very beautifully. We just have to buy some cheap, uh, just uh, cotton textile from the local textile shop. So we also give business for them as well. So it's all sourcing from the local market, sourcing from the local people. I think we have to go for the creative way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so... Uh, Another question from an anonymous, uh, similar but slightly a, a slight different uh, uh, on challenges as well. Uh, throughout the process of the place-taking project, any 
greater challenges came from the organizations that opposed the ideas? Were there any challenges in that form of uh, opposition from, from, from parties or from, from certain people or certain groups or whatever? Uh, um, that you faced? So far, we have no objection from the local residents because I think they feel very proud because for the many, many decades, you know, we are not celebrating our local heritage and local culture. It's like it's just taken, taken for granted. So, and we, when we move in this site, it's, you know, it's uh, a lot of buildings are already very run down. So there's no problem with, you know, uh, where there are people are fighting for car parks or people are fighting for ownership of certain buildings. Unlike, for example, if you do it like, uh, if you do it like SS2, maybe people will be, the, the shop owners may complain that you, if you do this festival, I don't have customer coming in because they cannot find parking to buy their goods from my store, right? So these are the, most of the uh, place-making projects are actually happening mostly in the, more of the rundown part of the city, I would say. Yeah, but the, the, those like the booming part, I think that you can do place-making, but you have to take another approach or another kind of form of place-making, more of a carnival, maybe in a smaller scale, or you work it with the com some of the commercial tenants. Okay. Uh few more questions. Uh, it's rolling in now. Okay, uh, another question from uh, uh, Xiao Xin. Xiao uh. Do you think the general public in our society is interested in these local projects? How can we further raise their interest or awareness in this area? Um, I think they are generally very interested because they can enjoy the, the, you know, the exhibition or the work that we put up with. But the problem is that many are not really uh, going to be involved as they don't want to be a volunteer. Some, they come to enjoy. So it's how do you get a continuous support from them? I think uh, turning the support into volunteerism so that they can uh, be part of your movement. I think it's important to raise that awareness and, and, and through community building like this, I think some of the volunteers actually eventually become you know, our, our supporters and become our our. Uh, these uh, NGOs members as well. So you, you need time, you need effort, you need the heart and, and, and to, to melt people's heart. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think that's, uh, you know, when I approach you to, 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 to do this lecture, I said, you know, we, we need to reclaim place making. I mean, um, with all due respect to, you know, the other allied professions, I, I think, uh, as you have rightly pointed out, um, a lot of, you know, the so-called place making is termed as urban planning which is not very uh, it, it's not the equivalent you know? uh, place making is, is, is a process urban planning is, is, is a, a different it's process about hard, it's just a hardware yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I think this is the software part that I think uh, uh, you know yeah, that maybe some of the our allied professions have think, taken the position that oh we are the place making people and uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good sign that you know architects like you are um, are actively involved in place making, and I hope that more and more architects will actually come up and, uh, you know, be more involved in that way. I think sometimes we may live in this kind of like uh, ivory tower thing, you know, right. that, that you don't want to have too much issues and dramas. And you say, okay, you know, we, 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 we but, but as what you have uh, displayed or exhibited, um, is very important, and and that's the part of the whole process, you know, on your engagement with people that. That actually creates a success, you know, it's not just us alone. And I think we have also to try to learn to work with the community rather than work for or work with, or, you know, work with the community. Right. In sense. Yeah. Put yourself as part of a community. Yeah, I think a lot of times that like, we as architects, we, we just, you know, we just look at self as a role of a form maker and then and create a beautiful space and create a beautiful building and then off you go on to the next project. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think our role can be widened. Our role, we can play a better role in, in nation building, in, in, you know, especially in the post-COVID-19 era as well, to, to help the community to come back, to you know, grow again, rise up again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, people uh, still got questions coming in, which is good. Everyone's like, you know, maybe they, they took like okay. up to the end of your whole session and like, you know, trying to, you know, like, you know, uh, um, okay, there's one from uh, Noliza Razali. Uh, is it possible to collaborate this kind of intention in place-making ideas with any government sectors in Malaysia? 
Okay, something I forgot to highlight, like uh, the book, uh, one of the books I read um, uh, from Taiwan, uh, the literature, uh, you will be amazed. Um, in Taiwan, the placemaking exercise is engraved in the government policy. You can see here this on the right-hand side. These are all the government agencies or ministry involved in placemaking. Say, for example, for the Ministry of uh, this Agriculture, they will have uh, agriculture pilot project for farmers. For Ministry of uh, Arts and Culture, they have uh, you know they have grants for artists to work with the local community, like for example, making public art, you know, revival of a certain uh, village or rural town. They actually give the grants to artists to work with the local community to come up with some public art that can then uh, you know use it as a kind of a, a catalyst to revive the town. And they don't move in one single ministry. They move with the whole ministry working as a community, as a committee. From JKR to Ministry of Education as well, they can, they, they have like uh, projects that they teach the, you know, some of the rural town, the kids are maybe poorer in, in, in their languages, skills and all that. So they send in, uh, they send in placemakers and they do storytelling. They, they, they teach them how to, how to write and, and all that and read in English or something. I'm just citing as example, I'm not talking about a real uh, specific questions, but uh, actually in Taiwan and Japan, they're already doing this. So there's no, there's definitely there are ways that our ministries can, can contribute towards space making and starting with uh, maybe from the direct one, like our, our Ministry of Rural Development, our Ministry of Agriculture, right? This few ministry definitely can, can work up certain pilot project together. Okay. Uh, a question from an anonymous attendee. What is your ideal version of an urban city? Well, if you ask me, I mean, for me, I've been, I've been living in Kia for the past 20 years. And, you know, a lot of us, I think, working, working hard and save up to travel. And when you go for holiday, like, for example, you go to go to uh, cities like you go to East, East Asia, you go to Taipei, you go to Japan, or you go to European cities, like you go to um, smaller cities, uh, like, uh, you know, maybe in Spain, like Barcelona or smaller cities. You, why, why you enjoy so much there? Because it was so fun, right? It's, it can, it's, it's so, so walkable uh, and public transport is convenient. So I think for our own city, we have to do something uh, from the top, I think city councils and the governments should do something on the infrastructure. And even for placemaking, they should also be you know, looking at this as an option to improve the livelihood and quality of the life of the, our citizens. But for we ourselves as, a, as a KL folks, we should be doing something within our neighborhood as well. We can do something within our neighborhood to, to improve on the the connections between the community members. And when only when you have this feel good factor, then this is what I call the, the ideal city. Yeah. Of course, you have to take into account other environmental factors like you know, recycling, going for green, uh, sustainability, all these SDGs are basically you you can bench, benchmark us, we can benchmark ourselves again, all these SD, SDG uh, key points. Yeah. Uh, okay, I've got a few more questions. I will quickly yeah. Uh, uh, read, read, read it and uh, maybe you have to do shorter answers because we've got about five or six. Okay. Uh, how do you achieve placemaking in a new development as there are no communities formed yet, yet you are only uh, able to provide programs that hope people will use it? Do you have any formula for this? Okay. Uh, something to share is uh, recently we are working on one high rise project. Most, the location is within a community, right? We start like nearby all oil farm and state only. So, what we do is that we, we, we do a survey of what's happening on the community. And then uh, when, we, when we plan the, this project, we also try to visualize or try to imagine who would likely be the users of your project. And then we start actually engaging them. Some of them are actually from local, within the vicinity of your project. We start to engage them. We start to talk to them. Maybe get, just even getting the feedback, you know. If we are doing, if we are doing this project, what, what can we do? What can we improve on your daily life? You know? So they, you know, like maybe your project, you can have 
uh, urban farming or you can have a, a, a community center or an education center or, you know. So we start to engage these people and then we, we actually allow the program within our project. Of course, under the approval of the client. Yeah. So we do this prior to the completion. You know, a lot of times if you complete the building, then the end will come in and then they have to modify the buildings. But no doubt, maybe you have to re you have to design the project twice. Uh, if you, you, you can't get the stakeholders coming in the early stage. Okay. Uh, yeah. Question from uh, Tan Kim Sheng. Uh. Uh, do you think involvement of architecture students from college and universities play an important role for the preparation progress? I strongly encourage the universities to adopt this approach as well because from, I think, like our, for our office uh, internship program, I start to involve the interns in their, in their in the internship. So at least they get the experience of working with the community. And when they get out from you know, to work, at least they have that mindset. If they, you know, if in the future they, they come across this, how, how can they approach? Uh, how can they, you know, rather than just treating it as a building, treating it as a more of a place making approach. And then we also hope that, you know, with this um, so-called, calling for more young architects to participate in uh, these uh, placemaking projects. Uh, we can then uh, expand our network, expand our works uh, towards this, uh, this, all this new arena. And then this maybe can provide job opportunities for young architects as well, young graduates to participate further. Yeah, this is how Taiwan did it. You know, Taiwan, they have this whole network of education system where they, they send the, the, the students to go back to the kampong to do placemaking. They help with the kampong, maybe farmers as a farmers, uh, how to improve their farming, then how to market. And, and then the, the, the summer students actually stay on and become part of the, the community. And then they even further study to take a master and PhD and become a professors and teaching more students to actually uh, continue this exploration. So we haven't started anything in Malaysia. We're just talking with each of these ac our academic institution is doing on our own. You know, we should we should actually form a more uh, unified alliance to, to do this so that we share resources, we can share information and we do the training together. Okay. Uh, a question. Uh, community building and place making projects gather people and volunteers from all works of life, personalities and mindset, etc. What is or are the principles of philosophy of life that you hold while dealing with the team members when any possible disagreements or arguments uh, occur? If any. Yeah, there are also, of course, there will be like uh, different opinions to certain things, but I think if we are achieving the same, we have the same objective of making our, our so called our hometown be a better place to live, I think we can uh, agree to disagree. Lah. So we don't need to escalate the argument to, you know, to be publicly, you know, uh, discredit uh, 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 each other. But sometimes the, when the group grows too big, also you have a problem because then there are too many cooks in the, in the kitchen. So I would suggest that maybe to break into a smaller group also is a good idea or working within uh, different groups but having a same objective, you know, you, 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 you still can. Some maybe focusing more on uh, literature, some are working on performance art, some are working on maybe uh, merchandise, art and merchandise. It's okay. Some are on food and beverages. So you can actually uh, is vented into a smaller working group. Okay. Hmm. Uh, question from Ahmad Fazil Mohamed. Mohamed eh? yep. Architect, I learned in your own experience when the local authorities generally helpful with facilitating and granting approvals for this kind of works. Was funding a problem in most of them? And how did you and your team generally overcome this? Uh, well, I'm very glad that we have a very supportive uh, YBs. Uh, that means we have three state aduns and one member of parliament who were very supportive of our initiative. And then they become the link with uh, the city councils. And then city council, of course, they don't have the funds to support you, but they have a lot of infrastructure they can support you. For example, they have their traffic control system. They have their cleaners who can clean up your site, clean up your longkang. They can manage your traffic. They have also the, the petania, the, this, uh, all the decoration flood, uh, potting plants to decorate your, your, some of your spaces, right? Uh, so, so they can provide you all this support in terms of the infra infrastructure and also maybe give you the space, some of the public spaces as a venue because you cannot simply run this space making 
projects in the public space because they will find you, they will stop you from doing so because it may cause uh, inconvenience for the local residents in terms of parking as well. So you have, you have to work with them in, 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 in together to achieve this uh, smoothness. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh, okay, next one. Uh, okay, this one is uh, uh, actually... Uh, a short one. Okay, this is actually, this is actually a statement from uh, Kylie Go. Uh, Thank you, sir, for being a part of this. Just to tell some thoughts. Uh, place picking made the biggest part. I think it's a belonging feeling that created that couldn't be found in other places, especially for those who left the town. The special event or irreplaceable memories that certain place making brought up to definitely will raise up the willingness of youngsters going back to visit their hometown. So much learned. So, you know, we've got the pen here now. Uh, another question. Okay, I mean, I'll take a last question because we, we're slightly running over, but, uh, you know, since we've got a lot of uh, questions, I think I will try to clear out as many as we can. Uh, another question from uh, Xiao Chin. Uh, a short one. Is there a website where we can see the entries from the New Village Ideas Competition? It would be interesting to see what were the shortlisted ideas for the different regions in Malaysia. Yes, I put it here, the Facebook Village Vision. But of uh, course, uh, unfortunately, it's all written in Chinese, lah. There's no okay. English only. Yeah. Okay. The Chinese version. So that's why I said, I think place making, we have to cross religion, we have to cross language, we have to cross boundaries in order to make Malaysia a better place. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think, uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, firstly, uh, okay, I'll say thank you so much for, uh, share, for your sharing session. It's, uh, you know, it's been an eye opener for a lot of us. And I think it's generated a lot of interest from our viewers. Uh, I think we are up to okay. 432, uh, about almost 500 plus viewers from, on FB and Zoom. Um, okay, so uh, thank you again, uh, Alan. Okay. And, uh, okay, we have come to the end of the uh, second DLS of season 9, 2021 22. Uh, tune again uh, next month on Wednesday, 13 October, uh, where we'll have the uh, internationally renowned Dato, Dr. Architect Ken Yang as our speaker with his lecture. Reinventing architecture based on the science of ecology. Okay, so uh, we will be sending out all the uh, uh, invitations uh, to participate. So uh, maybe probably by uh, you know next week. So uh, tune in and register early. Uh, I think you'll be quite uh, well attended as well as today. Uh, so thank you everyone and good evening. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Guys. Bye. Bye.